All right, friends and neighbors, let us have a word of prayer. O oh Lord, we come to this day knowing that you have created it, knowing that you are in it, knowing that you have given us life to live for this day. You have given us the life of this small community that gathers to study your word and to share in life and to seek to continue that process of, uh, of growing and learning and, and being refined and purified and strengthened so that we might begin to learn to love the world as Jesus loved it. We thank you that we know about him. We thank you that others have told us. We thank you that you give us a chance to tell others. We thank you that you lay others in our pathway that uh, give us an occasion and an opportunity to love and to serve together. We thank you for these moments that we have now, asking, as always, that you would be in them, that you would be with us, that you would stir in our hearts and stir in our minds to teach us more and to inspire us more so that we might be more faithful to you and bring your blessing to bear in the world that so badly needs it. We lay that before you now as we gather, all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okie dokie, we're still in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> I think it's helpful. Um, this is a, a good principle of Bible study. Um, as you're zeroing in on a few verses or a few sentences, it's always a good idea to know where you are in the big picture of things. And where we are in the big picture of 1 Corinthians is that we remember that Paul has started a church there. Now he's gone. The church is around five years old, probably. It is a church comprised primarily of uh, Gentiles, of people that have had no background or understanding of, uh, of the Jewish way of looking at the world. And so they're being introduced to Christ as well as being introduced to all the knowledge about God and all the history of God's people through Israel and all of that stuff all at the same time. They've got to learn it all brand new. The advantage of that is that they don't, don't have any misconceptions about things. They just have no conceptions whatsoever. With the Jews, Paul's job, uh, the early church's job, was to say this Jesus actually is the Messiah and to help convince people of that fact. Uh, even the idea of Messiah was new to the Gentiles. So we say that Paul is socializing or re-socializing uh, the Gentile Christians to learn how to live in a community of faith. And in a way, that's what Christians are always doing. So that's, that's what Paul's task is. And as he's doing that, he's teaching them how to think about the whole world. That's what we mean by worldview, the way you look at everything. He's teaching them to look at the whole world and their place in it and how they function in it in a new way and a different way. And he's especially lifting up the value and the place of the community of faith. The Corinthian Christians are called to love each other and to be a family with each other. And there are problems with that. That's what the letter is pretty much all about. There are problems of factions that have developed within uh, the community because some like one teacher better than another teacher. There are problems of, of, of um, immorality and sin and all kinds of dysfunction in the members that they're trying to, to learn what it's all about, learn what it means for the community. Last week, Paul was talking about the quite basically the question of incest um, and, and its impact on the community, and also the question of, of how people understand that they are meant to function now that they follow Jesus, the moral and ethical uh, uh, laws, rules, if you will, um, the, the way that God has taught us to live. That's what Paul is trying to teach the Corinthian t uh, Christians. This is how God has taught us to live, not the way you used to live, but now a new way to live. And he's continuing Continuing that conversation in today's passage, again, lifting up the value of the community and also new ways of thinking, what are new ways of thinking to the Corinthian Christians about how they're meant to relate to each other, okay? So that's the broad context of what we're looking at. Let's look at the first 11 verses then of chapter 6, and we'll read them and then start to take them apart. When any of you has a grievance against another... Do you dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? 
Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels, to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases, then do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to decide between one believer and another, but a believer goes to court against a believer and before unbelievers at that? In fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud and believers at that. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That seems especially appropriate when Paul takes the gloves off and starts hitting hard. <laughs> and he's doing that here. He's doing that here. Okay, it will be helpful, I think, for us to understand uh, or seek to understand what is going on when Paul raises this problem. The issue he's talking about now is, is lawsuits among the people in the church. Believers are suing believers. Believers are taking other believers to court. Uh, and it's not just believers. That the word that's translated believers here is actually the word brothers. Um, and, and a lot of biblical translations uh, try to get away from, from any gender-related language, and so they say believers. But, but you lose a little bit of the, of the strength of the family connection there, right? You could just as easily, and, and should probably just as easily, say sisters. Sisters are taking each other to court, right? Um, some of you have a sister. Are, some of you are a sister. Um, don't raise your hand. I, I'll bet all of you know about cases where family members have taken other family members to court, right? What a, what a disastrous situation that is. What a tragic and, and, and sad situation that is. When people who are family with each other take each other to court. So that's going on in the Corinthian church in some way, shape, or form. Some of the background to that that we need to know about, and some that's informed by other parts of this letter. In the ancient Greek and Roman world, especially the Roman world, um, there was a problem with the court systems. They were corrupt, okay? You say, well, what else is new, <laughs> Okay, but they were really corrupt in the sense that those who were selected, those who were appointed to be judges in the, the, the legal systems of the day, uh, were appointed by the governing authorities, the government, all right? The, the governing leaders were the rich, the powerful, the wealthy, and uh, the politically connected. And they appointed their friends to be judges in the court systems. And so it was easy if you were, were in the upper class of Roman society, it was easy uh, to create lawsuits against people in the lower classes, maybe to take their property or take their crops or do whatever it was that you wanted to do that took away something from someone. It was easy to do that if you were a rich person because all of your friends were the judges. And you could afford to hire the best lawyers. And this was a known problem in Roman society. If you were poor, if you were not connected into the political elite classes, you had no hope in the court system. And it's possible here that there are some of the rich Christians who are suing the poor Christians because they can easily win their lawsuits in the court system because they're friends of the judges. We think that, that that's been happening here, partly because Paul talks about that problem uh, in another vein as he writes to the Corinthians. He says, when the church gets together to, to celebrate a meal together, even to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we need to remember that 
that communion back in those days was actually a full-blown meal. And people would remember in the breaking of bread and the sharing of cup, they would, they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. It was not just, you know, let's get together with the tiny little cups of watered-down grape juice and the little pieces of cardboard that we tell you are actually bread, right? Okay. No, these are real meals. But the problem was, the problem was the rich Christians would come and bring all this great, wonderful food, and they wouldn't even necessarily share with the poor in the church, right? So this, this, this class division, this class division, and the abuse of the powerful class against the unpowerful class, the powerless class, that was an issue in the Corinthian church and probably also an issue here in this question of the lawsuits. And so Paul says, this is going on and it is absolutely ridiculous. It's abhorrent. It's not the way we are meant to live, right? Not the way we're meant to live. And so he goes into, a, a he, he makes reference to a few things here that are a little bit hard for us to understand unless we understand the larger theological perspective that Paul and the early Christians had, right? He says, you're, you're creating lawsuits, uh, uh, you, you're taking things to court, you're, you're taking things to the unrighteous, right? You're taking things outside of the Christian community. Why do you take disputes that exist within the Christian community and take them outside of the Christian community for resolution? Can't you judge these things yourself? Can't you take care of your problems with each other among yourselves? It's kind of like the family should be able to settle its own problems, especially a family that is, is learning to live and learning to function in a completely different way than the rest of the world. Uh, it, it's illogical and, it, and it's not working and it, and it tears down the fabric of the family itself. Then Paul brings in the, the question of saints, right? Paul talks about the saints. Why are you taking your lawsuits outside uh, of, uh, and, and not allowing the saints to do, deal with that? Who are the saints, right? Who are the saints? Just the Christians. That's it, right? We, we, have, to, we have to go back through backwards through 2,000 years of Christian history. Saints are not uh, especially holy people or somebody who's known for doing miracles or something like that. We're not talking about St. Francis or, uh, or, or St. Saint, uh, Teresa or anybody like that. When Paul talks about saints, he's just talking about us, about believers, people who are brought into the, to the household of God, okay? So anytime you, you hear that word saints in the New Testament, it's not about the, the, those who are supposedly especially uh, uh, spiritual and good. It's about everybody, right? You all are saints. Let that settle in for just a minute, okay? <laughs> I know, you turn and look at each other. The two of you, you kind of, really? <laughs> okay, we're all saints. We're all saints. And then he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? What's that about? What's that? Revelation. Revelation. Yes, yes. That's, one of, that's another one of those phrases in Scripture. It's easy to just kind of gloss over because it sounds really good. But, if you, but, but does anybody really know what that means? Well, here's the idea. The idea is that when God created humanity in His image, He gave us a job. Remember what the job was? To have dominion over the whole creation, have dominion over the earth. Human beings get to rule. Okay, our job is to take care of God's creation, to use God's creation, to make all of creation work. Okay, we we lost our job. <laughs> uh, it got infinitely harder because of sin. But the vision is, is that when everything is restored at the end of all history, that human beings will again be in that place where we are, in a sense, co-creating and co-ruling with God. Okay. Paul says, look, that's who you are. That's who you are going to be. That's the reality in which you've moved. If, you, if God's going to put you in a place of looking over the, a whole creation, aren't you good enough at least right now just to take care of the little petty disputes that arise among you in the church, right? So it's probably not just lawsuits that are actually brought, but it's whatever problems and issues happen in the church. Have any of you ever been in a church that has fought with itself? <laughs> If you've been in a church, you've been in a church that has fought with itself, right? Right? Uh, churches fight over their property. They fight over everything, right? Uh, one of the men this morning talked about uh, his local congregation where they had a big dispute over what kind of hymns they were going to use, and so the church divided. 
over the hymns, for heaven's sakes. So, so Paul is teaching these Corinthian Christians that they're supposed to function in a whole different way. Because their problem is they brought all their old habits and their old thought patterns into this new life. And we should understand what that's like, right? What happens when you go to the doctor and the doctor says you're going to have to learn a whole new way of eating, right? What's the first thing you do? Uh, you, you go find a new doctor. Yes, you go find a new doctor, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> To learn something new means you have to unlearn something old. And that, that unlearning problem is, is a big one for the Corinthians. It's a big one for all of us, of course. These are human dynamics here. So Paul says, unlearn this old way of thinking, and here's the new way of thinking that you need to learn. Because you're in a new family. You're in a new kingdom. You're in a new reality. You're in something that is perfect and holy and good, but you don't yet know how to live within it and how you're supposed to treat each other. And all of Corinthians is really all about that. It's all about that. So one day at the end of history, the faithful are going to rule the world. And right now, Paul says, you need to start practicing that, right? You need to start practicing that. He says, is there no one among you who is wise enough to help you as a community deal with these issues. Remember, wisdom has been one of the big issues for the Corinthians. In the, in the, the ancient world, everybody was so proud of their own philosophy, their own heritage. They were fighting about all that stuff. They said they were wise. Paul said, no, you're not wise. You're actually foolish. The wisdom that you need to have is the wisdom of learning the way of Jesus. Isn't there anyone wise enough yet in the way of Jesus uh, to, to learn, to, dis, to solve the disputes that are within the church? He says, all of this that's going on, all of this going on pits believer against believer, brother against brother, right? And, and so, so there's the issue. That's the, the presenting issue now that Paul, he's got a whole laundry list of things. Uh, did you ever wonder if maybe there were more things that just didn't make it into the letter? What, you know, what if we had 12th Corinthians or 38th Corinthians to look at? How many letters does it take, right? Maybe a lifetime worth of letters. Then Paul, then Paul, this is a brilliant move that Paul makes. Paul says, in fact, to have lawsuits at all with each other is defeat right there. How, when you say that you are, you, that you are family, that you love each other, how can you even allow a dispute to arise, right? Especially how can you allow it to rise to the point where you have to bring in outside help, where you have to litigate a situation, right? Has anybody here ever, ever functioned as a mediator in a court system? Has anybody ever done that? I, I did a little bit of that kind of thing in an unofficial sort of way when I worked uh, in, in the, the field of alcoholism uh, in the DA's office long, 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 long time ago in New Mexico working with families to try to resolve issues that, that came about because of, of alcoholism in the family. Um, and and um, all of us know about the role of mediator, right? Before you go to court, you go to someone that tries to help you resolve things at a lower level, right? Paul says, even to go to court itself is a failure. Would you rather not be wronged than to wrong someone? Would you rather not suffer than to inflict suffering on someone? And here's where Paul, Paul is brilliant uh, because Paul, Paul knows uh, a, a good bit, apparently, uh, about, um, about pagan philosophy, ab about the, the Greek philosophy especially. Because Paul continually makes reference to Greek philosophy throughout this letter and in, and in other letters, other stories that we have about Paul. Remember when he goes to Athens and he goes to the Areopagus, that place uh, close to the Parthenon, where where the Greeks come to, where the Athenians come together to discuss philosophy with each other. And he says, "Hey, this you're this is a great city. You have all these statues to all these gods. You're very religious people. That's wonderful. And you even have a statue to an unknown god here, right? Because you want to be sure to to cover your backside and make sure that you don't leave anybody out." right? Paul says, I want to talk with you about this unknown God. Paul takes the philosophy and theology of, that he finds out in the world, and he finds connection points 
He finds connection points there, and here he's found a connection point. Socrates, no less a person than Socrates, had said, and this is quoted, it's in uh, number 15 in your notes if you want to look at it, if it were necessary either to do wrong or to suffer it, I should choose to suffer rather than do it. Okay? And so Paul, Paul is trying to change the Corinthians' minds about everything, to change their worldview. But he finds within their worldview, at least some of their history, he finds some common connection points, uh, which is a brilliant maneuver when you're trying to talk to people uh, about, about religious concern, religious issue, actually when you're trying to convince them of anything, right, is find the common ground. Here, Paul has found the common ground. Although not everybody would accept what Socrates had to say, Paul at least could say, look, this is in your own philosophy, your own thinking. Let's look at what that is. So Paul, again, highlights just how disastrous it is to the community that they would have disputes at all, that they would not be able to resolve the disputes that they had, and that they would take their disputes outside of the community. Now, it can be kind of hard for us to even understand that context because today we live in a system where if, if you have something that needs to go to court, uh, that we think needs to go to court, um, we go to a court system that is, that is based, at least theoretically, uh, on, on principles and rules that establish equality before the law, right? Right? Regardless of what your social status is, regardless of what the size of your bank account is, there is equality before the law. Paul is trying to help the, the Christians create a brand new society. And to the extent that the Christians are able to do that, they're going to survive. They're going to thrive. If they can't do that, if they are just like the rest of the world, then there will be nothing unique about the Christian community. There will be no, they won't be living uh, in, the, in the successful way that, that God has taught us to live, and they're ultimately going to die away. One of the ways maybe we can get in touch with this, this sense of the special nature of the community is to think about uh, communities today that are organized in such a way that they're very clearly distinct from the rest of the world, Right? Now, you could probably take any single one of us and put us, uh, put us over in the grocery store or at the gas station or any place out in the world, and, and we would look just like everybody else. And in some ways, we might act like everybody else, which can be a problem, right? <laughs> Do you know of communities where it's very clear that this is a person that, that is in a distinct community that is different from the rest of the community around them? The Amish. Okay, that's the easiest example for us, right? They dress differently. They, they, they don't live life the way that everybody else lives life. And, and I'm not, certainly not poking fun at that. I'm highlighting that as a way of establishing the identity of the community so that the community stays strong. And when the boundaries of that community get too fuzzy, the community itself starts to disappear, and then the way of life starts to disappear, and the, 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 the genius, the philosophy, the, the understanding of what a good life actually is starts to disappear. We who live in, in modern Western culture uh, that, that has a, a, a veneer of Christianity in some sense on top of that, uh, it's hard for us to get in touch with that. Although increasingly, perhaps, it may be that the Christian community is becoming more distinct, although there are different kinds of Christian communities, or at least communities that identify themselves as Christian in the world today, right? Um, but that's a worthy question to think about. Um, what about your life, what about our life together is different and special from the rest of the world? What is different and special about it in a way that helps encourage us to be more successful people, more loving people, and encourages us to be a better kind of community than the, the other communities around us. So there's what's at stake for Paul. Then he goes into a conversation um, where he's trying to teach the, the, the Corinthian Christians about, about how it is that their belief in Jesus should, must, necessarily um, uh, come forth in how they live. What they believe, what they say they believe, will change what they do, how they live. 
And so Paul goes into a conversation about how some people live and says, this isn't the way we're meant to live. This is not based on belief. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, I want to take that phrase apart because that has been, that's so easy for preachers to preach on, right? You have done wrong, you're not going to heaven. That's how that's interpreted, right? Wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. Now, if that's the sum total of the Christian message, then let's all have brunch. Let's just close the church and leave because we don't have anything more to talk about. Because I don't know all of you well, but I know some of you really well, and you're a good enough polling sample for me to say this. You're all wrongdoers. Okay. We are all wrongdoers here. Are we not going to inherit the kingdom of God? What is Paul talking about here? Well, this is not a conversation about repentance and forgiveness. This is not a conversation about that long, uh, crooked, uh, winding road that that we follow, uh, following Jesus, right? We have to think about that. What Paul is lifting up for us here is that when we continue in wrong and think of it as right, then we have a problem. Not knowing the difference between right and wrong, not knowing the difference between what is good and what is evil, uh, or knowing the difference but but then choosing the evil, that is not part of the kingdom of God. It's like by by our uh, our willing sinfulness or by our ignorant sinfulness, to the extent that we are acting that way, we are not in the kingdom of God. We're not living that way, right? To the extent that we are living in the way that God would have us live, to the extent that we are doing battle with our sin, not just giving in to our sin, then we are living in the kingdom of God or in that place between here and now and and there and then when everything will be complete and everything will be finished. So this this is not bad news for everybody. This is the good news that as we learn to live and grow in the ways of the kingdom, we are moving into the actual present reality of the kingdom of God here and now. Here and now. And then Paul uses that word inherit, right? You will not inherit the kingdom of God. From that earlier discussion of how the, the upper classes would use their power within the court system to take away from the lower classes, they were trying to expand their own little kingdoms, right? Expand their wealth, expand their influence, their power, their sphere of influence. And Paul says, look, you've already got the whole kingdom of God. You think that by your lawsuits, by your fighting, by all this stuff you're doing that you're going to inherit more? No, you're actually going to lose the only inheritance that makes sense, the only inheritance that makes a difference, the eternal inheritance of being with God, of being with each other of living within the love of God. Uh, And so there are all kinds of different ways that that almost every word Paul speaks here um, is attacking this problem, this cancer that's in the the Corinthian church. And then he goes into that list of of sins. Now, let's talk about the lists of sins, okay? Uh, Scripture often gives a list of sins. And those lists are, are what we call suggestive rather than exhaustive, right? If Paul were to write a complete list of all the possible ways that human beings could sin, we would need several volumes of the book, right? Right? Because there's, there, and there's new way we create new ways to sin all the time, I think, right? So the list is meant to suggest to us, these are the kinds of things that are not part of the kingdom of God. When we look at a list, I don't know about for you. Actually, I do know for for you too, because you're just as bad as I am. When I look at a list, I look at the things that other people do and say, yep, those are sins. And then I gloss over the things that I do. Do you do that? Right? I love it when there's a list and my my worst sins are not on the list. Right? Right? But then the list where my sin is on the list, I don't like to look at those lists. Right? Um, That's our tendency. Is it not? Say, oh, look at those horrible, terrible, no good, very bad people right? Well, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good list here. There's another issue in, in, in the listing of sins, and that is that we tend to see such things in, in just absolute, complete black and white, okay? Uh, there's, there's a couple things on this list um, that, that I want to look at briefly in a, in a more careful sort of sense, right? The first thing I want to look at is that word drunkards, drunkards. 
What do you think of when you think of a drunkard? An alcoholic, okay? We un- I, alcoholism is near and dear to my heart because I, I worked in that field for a while, a uh, long, long time ago. Um, and, and of course, alcoholism is all over the place. Um, do we look at a person today who is suffering from addiction to alcohol and say, you're going to hell? No. No, we don't do that, do we? No. Okay. Um, we do understand that alcoholism, in a sense, is already living in hell, yes. right? There, I, I don't think there's any other way to describe it than that. And, and there, I don't know a single alcoholic is really happy about being alcoholic, right? We understand more about the sources of sin, all the way from genetic background to behavioral background to addictive behavior, all kinds of things. We understand more about what sin actually is, right? Every once in a while, I still get the question from people, is, is alcoholism a, a sin? And I'll say, well, it depends on how you want to define sin, okay? Sin is anything that is against or opposite of or not up to the standard of what God wants for us, right? And in that sense, alcoholism is sin, right? It is sin in the sense that, that God does not want us nor do we want to be addicted to alcohol. It is not sin in the sense that, that we understand that, that so much of the sin that is in our world is something that we're born into. An alcoholic has maybe particular genetic uh, disposition or behavioral disposition uh, or, or societal disposition uh, to become and to remain alcoholic. There are lots of things involved more than just a person's individual choice, if you will. And, and so we have a much more um, complete and compassionate understanding of what, of what alcoholism actually is. And, and interestingly enough, we actually do a, a better job these days of helping people deal with alcoholism. It is still the case that the most successful uh, uh, person, the most successful system with which to battle that kind of addiction or any other kind of addiction is in the the 12-step programs where God is involved, where a community of support and encouragement is involved, uh, and we help a person live with and live through and live out of that kind of of behavior that that is destructive, okay? And so we don't preach about that sin like, you're a drunkard, you're going to hell, uh, which, which you could easily do if you just take these words uh, on, on a very surface level, okay? There's a couple of other words that Paul includes here that is a huge conversation in, in the world today, uh, male prostitutes and sodomites. This is the issue of homosexuality. Now, I'm not going to begin to uh, suggest that we can answer all the questions or have a full discussion of that today. Um, But we do have a better understanding in much of the world today about the complexity of human sexuality, right? And all of the things that that feed into that. And and we don't, don't, at least in, in some parts of the modern Christian world, we don't just condemn people for seeming to do something or be something that we think is wrong. Paul here Paul here uh, does not call for people that are sinning to be executed. Uh, In the Old Testament, you have some of that language. If a person is sinning in any way, and and there's lists of sins, um, that that they should just be executed. Okay, Paul doesn't, doesn't, Paul has made some advancements, right? Uh, And and in the the modern Western world, we don't execute people uh, because they are struggling with some version of sin. Now, I know in the sexuality question, a lot of people today want to say that homosexuality is simply not sin. We have a whole different way of understanding that. And and, um, I'm happy to visit with you privately about that or in another context. What I want to highlight for us, though, is that it's so easy for us to look at things like alcoholism or homosexuality and forget about everything else that's on the list. And that's where we have a bigger problem, is it not? Adulterers, thieves, the greedy, robbers, right? You are somewhere on this list. I'll guarantee you. And so am I, okay? And if if you're not, then we just need to add it to the list. 
I don't want us to focus on one particular version of sin or not. I want us to focus on the fact that all of us are on that list and all of us are called to, to be restored, renewed, healed, to move through our sin, through our lives. And as we do that, as we function better, we will inherit the kingdom of God. We will be living already in the kingdom of God. Notice Paul says, this is what some of you used to be. You used to be this. Sometimes people have the attitude that you're just born the way you are and that's the way you're going to be and there's no hope you can be any better. Do you know that attitude? That's not Paul's attitude. That's not the Christian attitude. This is what you used to be. You are not anymore. Why are you not anymore? Because you have engaged in a new relationship with God and you have become a new person. Paul then goes into a conversation about baptism. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. Paul is reminding the Corinthian Christians that as they have accepted Jesus into their lives, they have accepted and adopted a new way to live. That was a light bulb that just burned out up there, okay? Or it was God. (laughs) But I think it was the light bulb that burned out, (laughs) right? You have been baptized. You You have been buried and you died under the water as if you were buried in a grave. And you have been resurrected up out of that water, out of that grave as a new person. You were filthy, dirty, and caked in mud, and it was all washed away. You are a new creature. For the Corinthian Christians, he's saying to them, you're new people. You're not the old people you were. Learn how to be those new kinds of people. Now, in our world today, uh, in, in much of the church, we focus on certain kinds of sins. Paul has focused on some certain kinds of sins that were prevalent and and tearing the Christian community apart in Corinth. Uh, The greed and the, 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 the classism, the powerful exerting their power over the powerless for their own gain. There's lots of things Paul takes on here that you don't hear the church talking about a whole lot these days in some quarters. I think it's important for us to achieve that balance. But then for us to remember, this is who we are. We are a family. We are siblings. We have, we have the same father, mother. We have the same God. We, we are siblings with each other. Uh, just as strongly, even more strongly, Paul would say, because Jesus said it, more strongly than our, than our actual biological siblings, right? Remember when Jesus said, uh, you know, if you don't love God more than me, uh, if you don't, if you don't, Jesus put it in typical Semitic uh, overstatement. He said, if you don't hate your mother and father and brother in order to follow me, then you're not really following me. He didn't want for you to hate your father and mother and brother. He wanted you to learn that the love that exists in the community of faith is a more powerful love than the love that we might even have for our biological siblings because we've been engrafted into this new community of faith. So those are all the things that Paul is talking. So let me stop there. What are your questions? What are your thoughts? Where does this bubble up and, and, and create issues uh, and questions? And what other profound things would you add to this conversation? One thing that as I was reading this and studying this, it hit me that these are new Christians. And they have not had the history, the benefit of the Jewish tradition of knowing God. Mm -hmm. So this is all new to them. And this is why Paul's lectures to them has to be so powerful. Mm -hmm. Paul has that unique advantage of being a Jew, Mm -hmm. really learned, and having that miraculous aha, meeting Jesus. Mm He is a unique person. Yes. Very unique. And for him, it's very important to him that he educates the people to learn how to know this God, to know this Jesus. And that's why he has to be so stern in this so that they can understand. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely it makes sense. Yes, yes. We, I, 
in the church today, we we although we're we're starting to lose some of this some of this pride and and complacency and and self confidence, uh, because in a lot of ways the church is struggling today. But uh, when the church is growing, when everybody thinks, yeah, the church is doing just fine, we lose this sense of urgency for uh, for the issues about who we are and how we live. We we lose any sense that that these are life and death issues, right? Um, when the church starts to become less than what it is meant to be, when, when we start to uh, gloss over and not pay attention to all the disastrous things that are going on in lives because of sin, uh, when we stop taking seriously the good news of the, of the gospel, all of those things, we start to lose our identity, and ultimately then we lose that message of Christ. You see, we, we come from, from a 2,000-year history and tradition of people passing on that knowledge from generation to generation. And, and there's a great learned uh, cultural inheritance and a religious inheritance that's there for us. The Corinthians had none of that. And so Paul's trying to, to give it to them, you know, he, heaping spoons full, uh, unad- unadulterated. It's not watered down. Um, and you're in danger of losing that. We're in danger of losing that if we allow things to become too watered down, if we don't understand how precious the Christian community is, how precious the gospel is, how precious the way of life that we've been taught is and how successful it is. To the extent that we stop living as true Christians in the world, the world stops working so well. And that would take us into all kinds of fruitful places where you look at societies, families, systems that are badly broken and destructive for human livelihood for th- human thriving. Uh, and and that's, that's where the, 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 the effect and impact of the gospel uh, has been watered down or lost or maybe never had before at all. And that's what's actually at stake. I got a Bible and it just had the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And how important, especially after the last two years where we've studied Genesis and Exodus, that history. Yeah. How much, how important that is to us Christians today. Yeah. To know where we actually came from. That's right. It's very important, and I'm very grateful that we studied this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You can't understand the New Testament unless you have the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah totally, totally. Got another, okay, we're going over here. Good, Laura. As a follow-on to that discussion, um, you know, sometimes really basic things hit you with, you know, somebody puts a connection together. Um, all through the Old Testament, the Israelites were the chosen people who were to carry God's message into the world. Mm-hmm. The church in this time and in this time today is that chosen people. So the, the chosen people ch- moved from the Israelites to the Christian churches. Yes. And viewing ourselves in that manner really can kind of be a different light. And it was kind of a dawning to me. I'd never seen that specific connection before, but it was yeah. kind of powerful. Yeah, that is really important. And, and it's important. Uh, it, it has implications in terms of, of politics today uh, and in what's going on in the Middle East today. And it especially has implications for the life of the Christian church. The the first Christians understood that with Jesus, the identity of the chosen people, the people of God, um, developed, it expanded, it deepened. It went more purely to where God wanted it to go in the first place. Whereas the previous uh, understanding of chosen people was all about genetic, racial, biological, historical lineage. What, what Paul saw, what, what Jesus saw and taught, what the early church taught, was that even back then, in the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, in the time of, of, of the forefathers and the foremothers, um, that the, the genetic, biological, racial lineage and heritage was not the most important thing to God. Because you continually have stories in the Old Testament about people that are outside of that family being grafted into the family. You have women, you, 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 have, you have pagans, you have uh, God-fearers 
Jesus showed up on the scene and started including people within the realm of God's love and embrace like the Roman centurion and like the the half-breed bastardized uh, Samaritan woman at the well, right? The Samaritan woman. Um, and, And then Paul took that even further to understand, wait, the people of God is a spiritual reality. It's a spiritual kingdom. And so one of the definitions of the Christian church, that's right here, is that we are the new Israel. We are the continuation of the true Israel. And that becomes a very important conversation when you talk about the Israel that exists in the Middle East right now and what its role and place is. The church understands that we're Israel and that Israel is those people who are living um, in the way of the one true God. And then we have to talk about about what it what does it mean to live in the way of the one true God? Jesus obliterated all the old rules and categories. It wasn't about your your biology. It wasn't about your family name. Uh, it it was about what you did in the world. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Paul understood that it was not an issue of being Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile. It wasn't about the issue of being male or female. It wasn't about the issue of being slave or free. It was about the issue of what you do with Jesus Christ. And so to the extent that the church loses its understanding, that's who we are. We're meant to be God's chosen people exhibiting God to the rest of the world. And if we're not doing it, it won't get done. That is absolutely crucial. And the standards of that identity, the the creation of that identity is based on what we believe and what we do. And then we have to look at what did Jesus say to do, right? What did Jesus say to do? And and what did Jesus and the early church highlight from their own history, right? I always go back to Micah 6, 8 because it's so easy, right? What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. There's all kinds of standards that are very clear that have nothing to do with property, (laughs) nothing to do with boundaries, nothing to do with earthly kingdoms, nothing to do with ritualistic rules and regulations. They have everything to do with how we treat each other and the kind of societies that we create that either allow for human flourishing or do not. It's a very, very simple thing to see, except so many are are blind. Thank you for lifting that up. Yes, we got a mic here. We know from studying Paul that he's very intentional He's very, he says what he says for specific reasons yes. based on the audience he's addressing or the church he's writing to with his letters. Can you shed light on the reason you think in this case, it's the first time he uses terms he hadn't used before, mm-hmm. the pro- male prostitutes and the sodomites. I mean, yeah. those are very specific terms and he includes them here for the first time. You say in your notes, I'm yes. just curious, your insight or what, they say why. Yes, there, there is no question but, but that uh, the, the, the Jewish uh, uh, morality, the Jewish attitude towards sexuality understood that human sexuality was about male and female and making babies, okay? About, about, about monogamous, long-term committed heterosexual relationships. That was this. There are some people that want to say that Judaism uh, had a way of, of tolerating homosexuality, okay? And in, in a sense, I think it did. But, but it's very clear uh, that, that the biblical witness and, and the witness that is continued in the New Testament to the extent that sexuality is discussed at all, it is that very sort of traditional orthodox viewpoint. Um, Paul talking here, uh, male prostitutes uh, and and sodomites. Um, There were a couple of versions of homosexuality that were known in Paul's world. Uh, And this was partly a power issue. Older men would take young boys to use them for their sexual pleasure. Um, The world at that point did not know very much or talk very much about long-term committed uh, homosexual relationships. Uh, It often talked about rape. Um, it, all, it, it had different terms to use for, for the passive male partner in a, in a sexual relationship. I put a little bit of, of that in the notes because that's some of the specificity involved. So then what does the church do with all of that, right? I, th- I think we have to be honest and say that the little bit of reference that we have to homosexuality in the scripture is not positive in any way, shape, or form towards homosexuality. 
Let's just, let's just say that and admit that. I can find nothing. I can find uh, a lot of people have tried to say, well, uh, the, the, the New Testament world didn't know anything about what we understand about homosexuality today. Um, but, and, and, and the Bible isn't really serious about those things. I, I don't think you can go there. The Bible is serious about those things. But then the question becomes, what do we do with all that? Okay. And, and in my own thinking, when we talk about homosexuality, we're not talking about just one thing, right? Well, we understand that human sexuality is very complex. Uh, we understand that it has genetic uh, uh, background to it. We understand that it, it also has behavioral background to it. Those two things are mixed. We also understand that, it, that in all forms of sexuality, whether it's hetero or homo or however many other variations there are, that there are that there are healthier ways to be involved in sexual relationships of of all kinds uh, or any kind, and there are less healthy ways. And anything that involves rape or power or promiscuity is unhealthy. We also understand. Uh, I mean, there are very serious Christians in the world who will simply say, "I have never been anything but homosexual." There are also people who will say, "I was driven into homosexuality through disastrous circumstances when I was young." So we can't talk about just one thing as if it is just one thing. And I think the church needs to look with a great deal of compassion and understanding. Um, and understanding that people differ in their final judgments about all of these things. And also the church needs to, to focus more on what are the major issues of Scripture. Human sexuality is not a major issue of Scripture. You would think that it is, based on um, uh, some folks will only talk about sexuality uh, when they talk about Christianity. Uh, but we find all kinds of, of sexuality in the Bible. I mean, there, you know, there certainly was polygamy in the Old Testament, uh, even among, among some of the great figures uh, of the Old Testament, right? Um, and, and so that doesn't mean it's right, but that does mean it existed. The major things that the Bible talks about, the major things that Jesus talked about, were about, about how we treat each other in our relationships, about justice, about equality for everyone, about loving and encouraging everyone, about including everyone. Uh, and those are the things that the church, I think, needs to focus on uh, more so than just particular things. The, the church uh, recently, in the last hundred years, has, has picked on uh, homosexuals um, and um, and at times alcoholics, uh, and then also the question of abortion. And that's a, a whole nother question, right? We've, 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 we've focused on that as the sin above all sins, okay? At the same time that, that we have allowed and tolerated, you know, for 10 or 20,000 children to die every day of starvation in the world. Uh, so uh, the church needs to get its priorities straight in that way. Does that help you a little bit? That, that's how we need to have that conversation. And it, it would take, we could spend a year, frankly, talking about all the issues related to human sexuality and what the church does with all of that. Um, churches have done a great job of excluding people who struggle with certain kinds of issues in their lives, but then including other people without ever thinking about it, right? Divorce was a big one, uh, divorce was a big one for a long time, right? Right? There's no question but what the Bible uh, it, it speaks very negatively about divorce, period, okay? But there are things in the Scripture that take us to a different place with how we deal with that, right? Um, people ask me a lot still, is divorce sin? And just like alcoholism, I answer it that way. Well, it depends on how you want to define sin. In the sense that sin is not living up to everything that God would want for us, divorce is sin. Because divorce is a failure, right? Divorce is when something that two people intended didn't work, right? And we can talk about all the reasons it doesn't work, but it doesn't work in that sense. It is, it is sin. Is it an unforgivable sin, right? No, there is no unforgivable sin except for the sin of thinking that sin is unforgivable. <laughs> uh, the sin against the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, and and, and um, so I, I think we need to have a great deal more grace in dealing with each other's sin, and we have a, need to have a great deal more equality in dealing with sin. We need to call out the greedy among us. Now, that's one you don't want, <laughs> right? We need to call out, how about the gluttons? You know, gluttony, 
eating too much? Okay, how about sloth, laziness? You know, sitting around on your keister doing nothing. There's a lot of sins that we never talk about. We just pick certain ones. And that in itself is sin, I think. So, any, any other hot things you want to throw out today? <laughs> okay, one more. There we go. Susan. I know this, this probably sounds ridiculous, but is not making your bed a sin? I mean, most of us are pretty good in this room, and we're not doing greedy things or ugly things. So is not making the bed a sin or leaving dishes in the sink a sin or... Yeah, that one is, according to my mother. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can, can you help us define, you know, some of these little simple sins that we're committing sure, every day? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, the, the little ones I'm not worried about. You know, is it a sin to leave your bed unmade? Um, I, I hope it's... One of our friends, that he, he and his wife were talking about making the bed one day, and she said to him, she said, you never make the bed when you get up. And he said, that's because you're always still sleeping in it. <laughs> which was true, right? I think we should major in the things that the scriptures major in. And then, and then we need to not excuse ourselves so quickly from some of these things, right? Um, go to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, if you l- even look at someone uh, with an idea of using them for sexual pleasure, that's adultery. If you're even angry with someone, um, and, and, and think terrible things about them, that, that's murder, right? Uh, the greed is a good one because every one of us in this room will say, no, we're not greedy. And yet every single one of us in this room has way more of everything than we could ever possibly use. And there are people not too far away from here that need some of what we have. So what is greed, right? Every one of us in this room uh, benefits from economic systems uh, that existed long before we got here. We didn't make them, but we participate in them. Every one of us in this room, I know this is controversial, every one of us in this room burns up fossil fuels and and uses uh, non-replenishable resources of the earth like it was going out of style. Where are we responsible for that, right? Again, we didn't create these things, you and I didn't, but generations before us did, and we participate in those things. So we always have to question where we are with these things and then look at what God actually major, majors in, right? God majors in, in people not shooting and killing each other. Are, are we participating in that in some ways? We're part of the, the military-industrial complex of the United States of America that arms part of the world. Um, how do we do that justly? How do we do that rightly? Um, those are the, those are the deeper questions, uh, doing justice. So, okay. I've offended us all this morning. So, um, I would appreciate your prayers for me. Uh, may never see you again. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> Let's have a word together. Lord, we thank you that we can come together as a bunch of sisters and a couple of brothers to visit with each other about things that are near and dear to all of us. You are the dearest to all of us, and that that makes us family with each other. We thank you for our family. We ask that you would uh, help us learn how to continue to be family and to deal with some of the tough things of life, Lord, because there are so many of them. We would think about all those who do not yet know how to love each other successfully and well and pray that you would bless them uh, with whatever gifts they need to begin to learn those things and help us to be part of teaching them. May all that be for the sake of Jesus and his way in the world that we seek to follow. And we pray in that name as well. Amen. God bless you all. See you next week, the Lord willing.